Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach. So yesterday I did, I think, two or three community posts on the time that Mark Brooks had his chair stolen almost 20 years ago and he's still salty about it to this day. Now I had actually recorded a video, but I uh, forgot to take my reflux medicine and I was coughing every other word and it, it was basically unusable. I got one thing done yesterday. I approved the print file for Runner which is a Narzac book, which is available as an add-on. And I got him the list of all the Narzac books that need to be printed for add-ons. But it was not a very productive day, because I just couldn't stop thinking about a 50-year-old man <laughs> obsessing for 20 years because somebody took his chair at a convention. I just need to read this thing and get it out of my system. A thread. So here's a story I've rarely told. It taught me a lot about the comic biz, mostly how not to act. I won't be using names, so don't ask. This is about the experience, not the names. Many years ago, I was attending a convention here in Atlanta as a guest artist. I had only been drawing for Marvel for two or three years, so I was very new and very green. Most of my peers didn't know who I was, much less the fans. It was a Saturday and I was coming back from a late afternoon panel and planned to return to my table for the last hour or so of the show. Unfortunately, when I got up from my table, I discovered that my chair was missing. I had no idea where it was or who's taken it. I looked around Otis Alley in hopes I'd see a spare chair I could borrow for the last hour of the show. The alley wasn't busy, but most everyone was at their table using their one chair. I also didn't want to take the chair of someone that wasn't there, in case they came back. I rounded the corner and saw two very big-name comic writers sitting together and talking. I also noticed that one of them, I'll call him number one, had a spare, unused chair beside him. There weren't any fans around, so I walked up, but kept a respectful distance. I didn't want to interrupt their conversation, so I stood waiting for my chance to ask about the chair. As if I was suddenly noticed, they both stopped talking and looked up at me. I'm not sure of my exact words, but I remember apologizing for interrupting their conversation, introduced myself as an artist around the corner, and that my chair was missing. I then asked if I could borrow his spare chair until the end of the day, about an hour. Now this part I remember clearly. Writer number one laughed sarcastically for a second before going straight-faced while saying a deadpan no. He then looked back at big-name writer number two and continued the conversation as if I was never there. I stood there for a second shocked at how rude this guy was. I finally walked away mumbling something like, Okay, sorry. I proceeded to stand at my table for the rest of the day. And yes, I got a new chair the next day. Okay, so fine. Maybe I caught this guy on an off day. Maybe he'd had some bad interaction that day and I got the blunt end of it. Or maybe he's just an ass. I had no idea. But yes, it continued to bug me. A few years later, I was at a different con with a fellow artist friend of mine. We were both scheduled to be on a writer-artist panel, along with some big-name writers. I wasn't sure who else would be there until I walked into the ballroom with my buddy. As we walked in, I saw big-name writer number one already up on the days. I still had my grudge, but thought that we were more on equal footing, since we were both panel guests. So maybe this will be better. Second chances and all that. My friend already knew the story from years ago and noticed number one was part of the panel about the time I did. He quickly said that he knows number one and would introduce me. Hey, a friend intro would surely change things, right? We both step up to the days. And after putting our stuff down, my friend begins chatting with number one. 
I'm standing there in the mini circle, politely listening. Finally, my friend says, Oh, hey, this is Mark, and motions to me. Without missing a beat, number one goes dead faced, looks sideways at me, and says, Hey, before quickly looking back at my friend to continue the chat. That was it. That's all I got. At that point, any amount of benefit of the doubt left me. If anything, I was angrier at myself for allowing it to happen again. I wanted to be wrong about this guy. As we sat, my friend gave me a grimace and said, Dude, I'm sorry. I wish I could tell you there was a conclusion. Or at least a strike three, but there wasn't. I decided number one was dead to me. I'd not put myself in that situation again. At that point... Number one would have to make the effort if he ever wants to meet me. He never did. The thing is, however, he taught me a valuable lesson. Both those situations stuck with me, and I vowed to never treat a stranger or peer like that, at least not when they've done nothing to me. I'd be better than that. But the biggest lesson is remembering that we never know where we'll be years from now. That upstart artist or writer may be the publisher or art director of a major company in 10 years. Or maybe their name will get big enough and you want to work with them. In this case, that's what happened. It's been 15 plus years and I've worked very hard to improve as an artist and grow my reputation and fan base. I treat everyone who comes to my table with respect and kindness. And I now get approached for work instead of having to chase it. But I've never forgotten the lesson number one taught me. And I've never worked with him. And for good reason. When I'm asked by a client if there's anything I'd like or concerns I have about a project, I say, yes, one thing. I'd rather not work with writer number one. I've never lost a gig due to this request, so I think I'll keep making it. So be nice because you never know who you're talking to or what they'll become. Besides, it's just the right thing to do. And honestly, fuck that guy. Was it Peter David? No. Peter's been nothing but nice every time I've seen him. So I feel better. I have uh, a weight lifted off of me. Um, one thing I always laugh about is this guy's 50, which means this happened when this guy was in his early 30s. This wasn't like a shy 19-year-old and some gruff old... I remember when I first started going to conventions. Like, this was so long ago that you would see Bob Kane. And they all looked like gangsters. All those old guys, they all looked like gangsters. So I can understand if you're like 19 and you're talking to... 75-year-old Bob Kane who's looking and acting like a gangster. But, bro, you're like 33. <laughs> That's hilarious. Anyway, before I go, Jawbreakers Forever, graphic novel. Iron Sights 3 and Impossible Stars 2. Not available for sale to big-name writer number one. Anyway, thanks for watching. Bye.